Hello, everybody. Um, let me introduce myself. I am Professor August Lopata, and I'm a chair of a special session on intelligent methods for data analysis and computer data software engineering. And we, we will have uh, six presenters in our session, and uh, I suggest uh, that the uh, speaker will have 10 minutes for presentation and five minutes for uh, discussion. So totally 15 minutes for each speaker. And let's start. The, the first speaker is Olesa Kuznikova. So uh, I'm Alessia Kuzniko from uh, VGTU, Vilnius Gdybinus Technical University. And uh, today I'll talk about um, adaptive uh, cloud resource provision at total scaling for cloud native uh, applications. So before talking about uh, adaptive resource provision for cloud uh, applications, so it's worth mentioning that uh, cloud is already exists like for more than 20 years. However, sometimes in, in, in literature, uh, people are still confusing virtualization uh, and, 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 and cloud. Uh, and the main difference is that cloud is not just a virtualization, yeah, it uses uh, virtualization, however, it's a service which you use it uh, as, as a self-service. You can request different resources and um, <coughs> Uh, we, for which you are paying uh, as you go, so you are interested in efficiency for those resources, and also cloud provides you a rapid elasticity, so virtually providing unlimited amount of resources you need, uh, so you don't care too, bu too much about the uh, underlying infrastructure. And in the same way, like uh, it took uh, uh, around a decade for people to realize that uh, development of cloud applications uh, for cloud uh, is not the same as uh, developing the, uh, the application for on-premises solutions uh, where you have just a virtual machine that is stable, you, you spin up your application and it runs. Uh, in cloud, um, mainly the cloud infrastructure or platform is not stable platform. It's, uh, it's designed uh, to be elastic and automated. So like very often uh, the resources needs to be switched on, switched off, and uh, as such, your application should be ready uh, for, for, for such changes. So <coughs> in general, uh, cloud native application uh, is different from classical application in the way that it's like a distributed system. Yeah, it's, it follows the good practices that it should have like a isolated state. So the components don't need to have some state in it or like it should be like minimized at some specific its uh, component should be loosely coupled, but the main, um, the most significant characteristics are the elasticity. So when you're developing applications, so it should be uh, developed in the mind that it will be elastic. So it will allow you to utilize as much as resources as you need and try to, to achieve uh, usage of resources in such ways that you don't uh, use too much resources or less resources uh, than you need. Uh, so, so, uh, so in general, uh, auto scaling and resource provisioning are the basis for elasticity of, of cloud applications. And the the issues with uh, auto scaling engines that are provided uh, out of the box in in cloud or in um, or, or by resource shadowers, something that the, in most cases they are based on reactive rules based, so it's like uh, uh, you specify a specific amount of, for example, resources or CPU, and when the threshold is uh, reached, then <coughs> then the, uh, the auto-scaling engine triggers the action and, and provides you additional resources. However, this can lead to ma many different issues like uh, uh, resource over provisioning, so you once again don't uh, use your resources as efficient as possible, but uh, sometimes resources might be provisioned too late, yeah, and this might lead uh, to SLA violations because service will degrade. 
And another thing is like uh, as cloud uh, native applications are now commonly developed using uh, microservices architecture, which has a lot of small pieces and, and components, you need to coordinate uh, that auto scaling um, issue, uh, auto scaling activities. Because uh, for example, we have a front end web tier, uh, which we start scaling and it scales so much that like at backend you have a database which not able to cope with the load that was allowed uh, to be reached to that database. Uh, so, so like instead of getting the service improvement through the auto scaling, you're getting the service degradation because you killed your database with too much load that you uh, open from your front end. And uh, another thing like um, uh, commonly auto scaling uh, uh, solutions that proposed in literature, they all almost uh, in most cases oriented in infrastructure. So either virtual machines or, or containers. However, cloud application can run or utilize other components which are provided by cloud as platform as a service. So uh, what it means, you can uh, get the database as a service, but you don't know, you are not aware, as, are there any uh, how many VMs are there, how many CPUs are there. So you're just requesting a capacity and you're using the, the provided capacity, like in form, for example, database, and you can scale it vertically, not only horizontally, for example. So you're just getting more power for your database. So, uh, so once again, when you're making a decision on auto scaling, you need to coordinate the, the action as database might, might scale slower than your front end. <coughs> and another thing with algorithms is like uh, analyzed in literature that uh, there is no one single auto scaling algorithm that, that fits all the cases. So one, one of the algorithms are better like for, uh, uh, for unpredicted log. Uh, um, some algorithm performs well when, when there is like a load in the form of spikes or unpredicted and other algorithms are better working with, uh, with the when, when the load is quite constant or like not fastly changing, or you have a periodic load uh, with specific pattern. So several works are suggesting to have just uh, solutions for that. So like either you can select an uh, algorithm based on a uh, specific significant metric. Yeah, for example, if you have a database, you cannot scale your web uh, server amount of web servers in the same way as you would be scaling your database because its uh, database will be slower, it will take uh, more time, and front end you can just like use a container, pop up it in milliseconds, and, and that's all. And also the the same is like uh, there are works that uh, recognize the pattern, and based on the type of pattern uh, of load or connections, uh, uh, the, the specific algorithm is selected. So, and of course you can also specify the type of your application, you know the type of application, and based on that you can uh, manually select the, the algorithm you need. So, to summarize it, like uh, the adaptive uh, auto scaling resource provisioning system uh, should have, should be uh, context aware, so it needs to know about the specifics of your application, uh, like what resources it needs, like what kind uh, of this application is it stateful or stateless, so how to scale it. It also should uh, track the dependencies between the uh, multiple components. So it should be a topology aware and uh, also should be able to uh, scale resources independently. Is it like virtual machine or container or it's like a platform as a service service. So you are getting more uh, storage uh, as a platform or you're getting a database and, and so on. The same containers. Uh, so so like what is the proposal like, to achieve it? So like, um, so like adaptive auto scaling system uh, should, have like, uh, sh should have more than like auto scaling engine itself, which cannot cope with all those complexity and monitoring system. But as addition, it should have a system say store, uh, which uh, tracks the state of your existing setup of your of your application or system. You know, for example, that like your, once again, like previously I mentioned, you have a front-end tier, which is 
like uh, now at uh, capacity level, for example, one, and you 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 you, you cannot. Uh, maybe better vice versa you have a small database so at this stage you cannot yet uh, start expanding your front end before your database haven't like expanded so so like uh, this is the purpose of system state store the execution engine is like uh, an engine that coordinates um, the different uh, um, auto scaling and resource provisioning activities so for example you need um, it, your application can consist of multiple components. Yeah, it's might as it's running on cloud, it can be like just like a traditional application. It might be part of the Docker. Yeah, it it can be uh, yeah, implemented as part of microservices. Uh, the, it might be uh, used as a function, or or, or, or use a platform as a service component, as, as mentioned before. So execution engine. Uh, would be responsible for coordinating the, the request of different resources from different uh, tiers, either from platform as a service, either from uh, infrastructure as a service, like uh, or talking to container shadowers if you have a container shadower and asking for, for additional resources. And system definition store is generally like uh, used to, to define your systems, the topologies, the requirements, so you can, for example, use. Um, Tosca templates, which define the dependencies between your application, between between the platform, between infrastructure, and uh, as can be seen, uh, there is like a, uh, a lot of products shown that can be realized with uh, could be used uh, to as part of this. So you don't need to create all those components uh, that I mentioned here. A lot of those are prepared already. However, like execution engine, so there is like um, still uh, uh, in unmature stage. So like uh, only few products that can uh, work together with uh, independently. Is it infrastructure or is it a platform as a service? So it makes seamless for your application or like for you as a uh, user of the system. It's it creates a layer of abstraction. Uh, from 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 cloud platform and infrastructure. And um, option, as optional components here, it's mentioned, uh, once again, you can go with container shadower, which will uh, do a lot of uh, uh, things that are mentioned here in co co core components section. And cloud resource provision, like Terraform, it also can simplify your work because you have um, your execution engine. And instead of it to talk to different uh, clouds, like AVS, like uh, Amazon, um, to Amazon Web Services or to Azure or other cloud, uh, you talk just to to that mediation layer created by by Terraform, and it requests for you like um, it talks to cloud resource provision API and asks uh, for resource. So you just develop uh, your your system only for to talk to that. Uh, um, Terraform component or cloud resource provisional component. So, in general, like uh, after the studying a lot of uh, documentation and products, uh, so there is like a gaps, and uh, which uh, the proposed uh, components or architecture was aimed to to address is like um, that there is a need uh, for coordination between. Uh, different components uh, of your application and it's also like uh, between the resource provisioning like uh, if it's like ES and PF, uh, PAS, platform as a service or infrastructure as a service and um, you need to track the dependencies between various layers of your application so auto scaling solution needs to look at it and um, yeah and that uh, simple auto scaling algorithm are not enough uh, to to achieve uh, elasticity uh, for modern uh, cloud application, as there is no uh, algorithm that fits all scenarios. And in general, uh, most of the components of proposed uh, architecture can be <coughs> uh, reused from existing products. However, auto scaling engine itself and uh, execution engine needs to be like worked out, and it's like a, a, a further uh, area of research uh, for for future development. So. Okay, thank you. <coughs>
questions? So I would like to ask one. Uh, I read the article and, mm -hmm. and then I found that you mentioned that your proposed architecture suge suggests usage of uh, optional mediation layers, yes? And yeah, and it's like and uh, that there is some disadvantage that there are more uh, additional points for failure, yes? Yes. So my question would be, are you planning to do something to solve that or just somehow adapt your solution? No, it's, it's more like, it's like you, you're choosing tar uh, between uh, two beds mm -hmm. or like smaller bed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your eyes can, I, I, it's, it will still depend on your application. If you want to have like a cloud independence, mm -hmm. yeah, so why is this component is like optional? Because if you don't try to achieve a cloud mm -hmm. independence, you can develop that execution engine specifically for, for specific cloud and you don't need that mediation mm -hmm. layer, but oh. you are losing uh, portability. Oh. And, uh, but if your goal is like uh, to have a portability, mm -hmm. then, then you have like, to choose, like, uh, give something and then take yeah. something. Oh, okay. So this is. Okay. And I have one question. What do you expect? What will be the final result of your research? Will it be architecture, framework, solution, methodology, methodic, or how you could describe it? So, so the goal of this was like just to be like as a starting point from where to start. Yeah. So I because. Understand. It overlaps together with um, a lot of with microservices architecture, yeah. which is popular now. And at the end of, of the research, it would be like maybe some kind of architecture with the best practices and like, yeah, like... Um, yes. Okay. More questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs> and Oops. this is the certificate. And this is one of the ah, so okay. you know, thank you. So, uh, so next uh, next present uh, presenter is uh, Aurimas Polonskis. Hello everyone, my name is Aurimas. And uh, I today will talk or like continue the discussion which my colleague Alessa started uh, about cloud software and uh, I will focus more on uh, metrics collection and aggregation for auto scaling. So, uh, but first of all, let me start with the latest trend and our motivation here. Uh, first of all, uh, 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 last few years, all new, new applications are basically cloud-based. Every, everyone is moving to cloud. Even uh, old on-premise solutions are migrated to cloud. So we see, in the, especially in the last few years, the huge movement uh, to cloud. This means that uh, software as a service solutions uh, must handle high loads uh, because uh, one uh, software needs to serve multiple tenants which uh, a lot of users, so it will be definitely high loads with certain applications. Uh, moving forward, scaling, automatic scaling is uh, uh, based on system load is, is a, a definite advantage, advantage here because uh, you need to do some cost saving and uh, you cannot have multiple instances running at night when there is no load at all. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, software development practices, uh, new software development practices emerges, such as continuous delivery. We want to release software more frequently, once a week, once a day, dozens time a day. And uh, this leads that all uh, Modern cloud software is based on microservice architecture, which means that we could uh, scale specific service instead of the whole monolithic application, uh, and also release it service one by one by uh, at any given time. So, what are the potential issues? Or, or what could be the problems with that? Uh, so, 
basically, currently, the scalability resiliency are based on uh, infrastructure level metrics, so CPU, RAM, uh, and there are no options to track application specific metrics, for example, business tra transactions made, and it's hard to ensure does the application meet SLA. Uh, the predictive scaling, uh, the popular cloud provider does not provide predictive scaling based on machine learning methods. So this is also a very useful area. We could uh, uh, implement solutions. Uh, furthermore, a uh, big issue is that vendor lock-in. If you start using any cloud provider and uh, start using it tools, services, script languages, you actually locked in with a specific provider, which could be a problem in the future when you want to migrate to another one. And if you want to run your software in different cloud providers, I mean, some different services use a best cloud for that job uh, means that you need to manage all application and it's very complicated to do it centrally. So our goal, kind of ultimate goal of all research is, is to create a self-adaptive microservice architecture which is able to monitor, uh, scale out, scale in uh, itself independently on any infrastructure provider. So in this particular uh, research, uh, the focus is to uh, metrics and uh, we need to uh, collect and aggregate infrastructure and software related metrics. Uh, we need to aggregate application nodes topology, so we need to know at any given time what the status of our application is, how many nodes are up and running uh, and so on. Uh, we need to address data storage issue, I issues and ensure quick queries. I mean, uh, metrics from a lot of microservices generates a lot of data. We need to store somewhere and uh, en ensure quick fetch of data for our auto scaling model. Uh, and uh, we need to have ability to manage the data amounts. We need to filter it. Uh, transform it and so on. So this task uh, I addressed it in, in my work there uh, and proposed an architecture which uh, will go more details with that that on the left we have any kind of uh, software application uh, which could be many microservices, it could be, could be few, or could be tens of microservices and uh, it's kind of fit to any size of application uh, and uh, application is actually independent on, on scaling logic because you can plug in any application to that. There's an agents uh, which are uh, shipping metrics data from any level it could be infrastructure, it could be container levels like Docker, it could be your custom application metrics, like number of business transactions, response times, or, or so forth. And we need to aggregate it to, to one place and uh, uh, then apply uh, auto scaling logic there. So the data for data storage, we choose quite a um, a popular technology stack is known ELK, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, which mainly primarily known for log segregation. But actually, we saw that you could use it as also for metric segregation there and storage. Uh, and uh, uh, then, auto scaling engine could fetch those data, that data. Uh, run some algorithms and instruct infrastructure provider or platform as a service provider or whatever provider with the scaling instructions so to scale out, to scale in the application. Also we could, a uh, common way to have a 
microservices, there's a kind of service discovery. And uh, service discovery stores the uh, service topology and ships it all, ship it also to uh, Elasticsearch. So I made experiments from two angles. It's, uh, uh, is that measure the performance of shipping data to data storage, what our delays are, and querying the data from that. So that was, I, would, I needed to, to validate it if it's a good tool set for, 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 uh, for us. So uh, regarding metrics, shipping and processing, we, uh, I ran into the, uh, the on, on very simple service. Uh, server uh, based on Amazon. I had 4 million test documents there uh, and I uh, was shipping, uh, tried with different numbers of agents and the result were that there's kind of no big noticeable impact of data processing time. So we actually able to ship a lot of data in parallel and store it. So fast, fast write operations. Uh, and we see that we have kind of around three seconds uh, delay there, but in our task, in our uh, problem, it's kind of tolerable delay. We could live with that. Uh, regarding query execution duration, uh, uh, we were running on the same test environment with the same amount of data. We saw that actually it's kind of linear dependency between amount of selected data and the time. So as much data you query in, it will be get a bit more uh, time. But also the network, we have a bottleneck, uh, because to transfer the huge amount of data, it takes more time than actually query it from the data store. So uh, conclusions about that. So we m I made the validation that that ELK stack is actually able to cope with large amount of data uh, and execute queries fast enough. Uh, data shipping was tested with 20 agents and uh, had a notice and degrading performance. Uh, and uh, I also proposed a solution to collect and store application notes to polish. So the future work where we'll be focused next is to on the auto-scaling engine, now to work with the data, apply some kind of algorithms there, uh, and, and uh, yeah, that's kind of my research. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, questions time? Any questions? Okay, I have one. Yeah. Could you please show the slide number five? Okay, and it is interesting how many uh, uh, software related metrics do you plan to, to collect, yeah? And how many groups of these metrics exist and how you will, how you will store them and... Uh, uh, it could be uh, as much as we need to run auto scaling. Okay, but what level of numbers? Is Thousands, millions. No, it's I guess it's on, on up to ten or ah, up to twenty. Is that okay. I mean some basic metrics which you could ensure. For example, for example, re response times, uh, ah. business transactions, number mm -hmm. of business transactions you're executing because that whole solution does not only can do auto scaling, but it could be used to identify anomalies like memory leaks, like you have. A huge load of server, yeah. you could see from infrastructure metrics, but you see that your business transaction remains the same, yeah. so it means there's somewhere leak there, okay. so, and it could be used for regular monitoring, basically. Okay, that's clear for me, mm. okay. thank you. Yeah, please. Okay. Of course, uh, the subject here is very critical, especially if you have a cloud infrastructure, the first thing that you must consider always is how you are going to monitor all your microservices running there and evaluate the infrastructure there. Uh, did you test any of uh, the open platforms that are uh, available, like uh, Prometheus and others? Sorry, which one? Prometheus. 
Uh, now there, are, there is a number of platforms that uh, they yeah. are already. Uh, you can use it in order to collect uh, information regarding your microservices and the virtual machines that you have, etc., and build your own monitoring system and uh, making the analysis after them. Uh, yeah, some but of them are open. Some other are uh, you have to pay them, but uh, mm. there are some approaches. Yeah, but they usually. Uh, my colleague Alessa did a full review of those, and uh, it seems that s some tools, they, there are a lot of tools you could collect metrics and do it for monitoring. But our goal is not the monitoring, our goal is to fetch data as much as we need, store it, and based on those data, do auto scaling. So I, I haven't yet any saw the tool like that in, in the market for microservices. Any more questions? No? Thank you. And uh, now we have the final procedure. Sorry. Oh, yeah. So this is the certificate for previous, for previous presentation and article because you are the co-author of this yes, article. Yeah, this is for this presentation. Okay. Certificate, yeah. And this is a certificate for your colleague <laughs> as <laughs> co-author. Yeah? Okay. So the next next presenter. We we will have two presenters is Vladimir Vladimir Kamanevsky and Ralph Christian Hockey. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Good. Sorry, microphone is here. Oh. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Ralph Harting, and uh, that's uh, Vladimir. And um, it's a pleasure to present uh, our uh, joint research project uh, of um, Aan University and Poston University. Boston University is doing research um, uh, since a long time on the quality of Wikipedia articles and um, we are doing research on um, search uh, engine marketing metrics and uh, in our project we try to combine uh, BOSS and um, um, therefore we um, figured out a, a research question how um, uh, how can um, can we use um, SEO indicators, also indicators of search engine uh, optimization tools um, uh, for the measurement of uh, the quality of Wikipedia articles? So what is the assessment of these indicators you know, for the quality, to measure the quality <coughs> of Wikipedia articles? That was uh, our research question. And um, yeah, we uh, uh, would like to start with a, a brief um, introduction to Cistrix, um, to Wikipedia, and uh, we proceed uh, with uh, our experiment, the data sets, and um, finally we have a conclusion and, um, uh, and some words about future work. Yeah. Um, 50% of the world population is uh, almost uh, um, using internet services and um, everybody knows that the most uh, important service is uh, Google search and um, re regarding or connected with Google search we have a lot of uh, new uh, tools no? uh, which uh, assist um, uh, digital marketing and uh, digital uh, activities on the internet and um, <coughs> and furthermore, we have um, a lot of, of course, a lot of um, visible domains um, in the search engine results, uh, so-called SERPs. And uh, one of the most important uh, domains, of course, everybody uh, knows that the domain is Wikipedia.org. Uh, and uh, that's um, why uh, uh, Wikipedia.org is so important. Um, we 
try to uh, figure out how uh, can we um, measure the assessment of um, specific indicators. Here, it just uh, some words to Wikipedia. It's the fifth most visited website in the internet. We have uh, 48 million articles now, and um, we have uh, now more than 300 uh, language uh, versions. Yeah, it's open and um, um, it's uh, used for enriching uh, knowledge bases. Some articles still have a poor quality in Wikipedia. No? And um, we have a quality grade in Wikipedia, but most of the articles um, um, don't, uh, don't give a, a specific uh, grade. No? And um, that's why we think uh, that indicators, uh, uh, different indicators are very important and uh, allow to build uh, models for automatic quality assessments uh, of the uh, articles. Uh, and um, several important indicators are related to references in Wikipedia articles and we tr uh, focused in our research especially on uh, references uh, in Wikipedia articles. Yeah, um, some, uh, some a brief overlook to uh, Systric tool. We have a lot of, um, we have a lot of tools um, uh, in the um, uh, area of digital marketing uh, in, um, in, uh, in Germany. The most important tool um, is um, Systrix. Systrix is, um, has the highest market share um, now more than 50% of, um, of companies um, which are involved in digital marketing are using Systrix and uh, this tool is a very powerful tool. Um, I made a, I had a lot of uh, 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 research activities, I did a lot of research with uh, uh, the metrics of Systrix. Um, they allow um, to support the whole uh, digital marketing process uh, uh, based on, um, um, on specific metrics. And um, we used uh, this tool to analyze uh, um, um, Wikipedia articles uh, in different and various granularity. Uh, um, mainly we foc focused on the host. Uh, but uh, we also um, had a brief look to URLs you know, um, in Wikipedia articles. Yeah, um, we selected um, five indicators. There are much more indicators available in, the, uh, in that tool, but um, we concentrated our research on five indicators. Um, we used uh, social signals uh, and um, um, this indi it indicator, of course, um, uh, covers uh, a large scale of um, social networks like uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, Google Plus, LinkedIn is also implemented in, um, in the Cisric toolbox and Pinterest. Then um, we used um, the, the metric SEO, it's called SEO in the tool. Um, this is uh, this metric shows the number of keywords uh, in um, different um, um, keywords, uh, the different keywords of a domain, um, which are achieved in the top hundred uh, SERPs. You know, SERPs means search engine result pages. Then we used uh, the metric backlinks. Uh, that means um, links. Um, from external, from uh, the external direction, external links, no, which refer to uh, the domain or to the website. No. Then we used uh, the metric universal search results. No. Um, these ones are also very important for uh, indexing of a website, and um, um, they are also um, um, uh, uh, part of of Systrix. And the um, most important um, indicator is the visibility index. Um, many agencies use the visibility index um, for their price, uh, for, uh, for pricing uh, their services. You know? um, they have quite often contracts with customers um, as higher the index is, as higher the, um, the service fee. You know? um, 
um, is for the for the companies you know? and um, usually um, um, the index um, of a website is generally created by a keyword pool in which each keyword is being ranked invaded within the Google uh, research results. Yeah. Uh, Systrix, for example, is, uh, is calculating with um, uh, a pool of one million keywords yeah, and keyword combinations per week, means weekly. Yeah. These are uh, the main uh, selected indicators and uh, we use these indicators for our experiments and uh, now Vladimir will proceed with our experiment. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Ralf. Uh, now, a few words about data sets and uh, results. So, uh, we choose some of the uh, language versions of Wikipedia uh, one of the most developed versions and the most developed version is English Wikipedia and we also take into the account French, German, Spanish, Italian and Polish Wikipedia. We use uh, parsers which allows to extract uh, different information about references including uh, URL address. So in English we have over 26 million URLs of references and uh, next versions have 4, 3, 2 million over 2 million uh, addresses of the references. We also extract hosts from, th from these address addresses and we had almost 2 million different hosts uh, in the English Wikipedia. Uh, so, if we choose uh, the most popular uh, hosts in each languages, uh, we talk about 5,000 the most important hosts. Uh, we can see that there are some overlaps between these language versions. Um, but most of the references are mm, uh, specific for uh, concrete language version. So when we analyze these most popular mm, hosts uh, with Systric tool, which give different mm, indicators, uh, for example, this slide presents uh, results of the, um, analyzing this host using visibility index. Uh, we see that uh, in uh, th the bigger value is in the uh, language version which are related to specific country. For example, if we um, analyze uh, hosts from German uh, version of Wikipedia, we have visibility index uh, from German side. Uh, the high, we have the highest value. Uh, another example, for example, uh, Italian from other language version. Uh, from Italy perspective, visibility index is the highest in the uh, local language version. Uh, another indicators which we took into the account um, and which was described earlier by Ralf is CEO, Universal Search and Backlinks. This uh, graphs presents distribution of this matrix in specific language version. So we see that <coughs> In German, the values of CEO metric and universal search is higher than other language uh, has. Uh, but in situation with backlinks, English version uh, has values, the highest values. 
Uh, we also try to analyze uh, Wikipedia articles. So we divide in English Wikipedia articles in four categories. We want to analyze uh, high quality articles and articles with worst quality class. But additionally, we can we wanted to choose from these two categories popular articles and not popular articles. So we have uh, four categories. Uh, featured articles in Wikipedia is uh, articles with the highest quality. Uh, Stub is the worst class. Uh, and uh, here presented indicators which we are taking into account. Visibility index, uh, social signals from different social networks, uh, especially Facebook. Uh, here we, um, uh, using sister tool, can um, extract uh, metrics, uh, some special metrics from Facebook, for example, Facebook likes, only Facebook shares, or how many people comment this article. Also, we took into account other social networks as Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, and Pinterest. So, this slide presents shortly results which we mm, received. If we analyze visibility index, that we can see that uh, here, when we have popular and uh, articles with uh, higher quality, we have significantly higher values of this metric. Uh, it's also interesting that articles with high quality but which are not popular uh, have zeros on every country from different countries' perspective. Because visibility index can be measured uh, from users from different countries, and it, this value uh, can be uh, vary. Uh, and uh, if we take into the account popular but uh, articles with the worst quality, we can see that it's closer to zero, but there is some values. Uh, if we uh, analyze social indicators, such as for example, uh, signals from Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and so on, we see similar situation that uh, unpopular articles, even if they are high quality, uh, usually have zero comments, likes, shares, and so on. But if you compare uh, popular articles and uh, compare this the best articles and the worst, then we can see very big difference between values. So, what are, what are the conclusions? First of all, uh, we can see that uh, CEO indicators can somehow show uh, differences between uh, articles from different group. We use such metrics as visibility index, CEO, universal search, backlinks, and social signals from various social networks. Um, uh, we also see that uh, values of these metrics uh, are significantly higher in articles with, uh, with the highest quality grade. Uh, popularity also shows that uh, these articles have higher va values of these indicators and uh, uh, of also we have some connection between country and uh, articles from this uh, from local uh, language version uh, there are a lot of directions in which we can continue this research, and this slide presents some of them. Uh, for example, we want to compare 
these indicators which we received from Systric tool with metrics from other similar tools uh, in the market. Uh, we want to add some additional indicators from this, including this tool, different tool, expand number uh, of articles, and of course, expand number of language version. As Ralph said before, uh, Wikipedia uh, has over 300 language versions. Uh, we also want to take into account possibilities of the mm, different granularity of the URL addresses of the web pages. Uh, we want also to learn how to detect a language sensitive topics in Wikipedia because some of the topics can be described better, for example, in English, some of the topic, for example, in Lithuanian language can be described better, for example, um, Lithuanian cities. Uh, and of course, this and future researches can help to improve different projects related to quality analysis of the Wikipedia. For example, we have project wikirank.net, which is used for quality and popularity comparison of the Wikipedia articles in different languages. Infoboxes uh, is uh, more related to analyzing quality of the info boxes in different languages. And uh, there is also project Wikibest, uh, which is uh, in some game form, propose users to analyze uh, quality of the data in multilingual Wikipedia. So, that is all. Thank you. Questions? Uh, for me, uh, I think that this big difference between these uh, indicators, because we have popular article, article can be popular, but it does not mean that uh, it has highest quality. Mm -hmm. So this significant difference between values, for me, it's um, maybe some... Thousands times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sometimes in <laughs> thousand times. Okay, I have one question. Could you please show the slide number eight? Yes. Okay, I wonder, are the, uh, the, this indicators, it, it means that there are the criteria, yeah, criteria, and are listed here the, uh, the uh, indicators groups, or there are indicators? Are you using only five indicators, or each this group can have uh, Amount, huge amount of sub indicators. Um, in th in th uh, it's just one indicator. Yeah. Um, uh, social signals. Yeah. Uh, in the tool itself, you can split this indicator, yeah. and you can also figure out uh, um, a metric for Facebook and Twitter. Okay. Uh, and for, for example, the social how, how many metrics do you use in Facebook for Facebook? In yeah. Uh, just uh, it means just uh, the links from from Facebook. Ah, no? okay. Mm -hmm. no? Okay. Yeah. More questions. Also, the quantity of uh, uh, of social signals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another simple KPI could be uh, the amount of the information or the amount of pictures that uh, you can find inside an article of Wikipedia. In it's most true. of the cases, when you open just uh, a page of the Wikipedia, if you see very less amount of information, you can understand the quality also of... Uh, it's true. A Wikirank project uh, uses these indicators, okay. images, references, sections, and something else. <laughs> but uh, because it's not only article uh, which are involved in, uh, and uh, for now, uh, it is possible to extract over 115 different metrics for extracted from articles and some uh, 
services connecting with Wikipedia. Of course, uh, this uh, uh, the goal of this uh, research is to try to include in this group of different metrics also metrics uh, related to CEO. Maybe uh, in the models, in this uh, complete models, these metrics will have high important, uh, importance. 100% right. It's just a sub-project. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, the next present is Andrea. Hello, my name is Andrea Germanaita. I am from Kaunas University of Technology and I would like to introduce uh, our research in the field of uh, basic uh, urban pattern description. Um, first of all, <coughs> the goal of our research was and still is to investigate and create the methodology uh, of a description and application of spatial patterns used in geographic information systems. Uh, the first uh, two tasks of this research was uh, to describe a very basic urban pattern that could be used in spatial analysis of vector maps and overview of uh, some of the spatial analysis methods. So. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, give a short introduce in other works and at first um, I should mention some of the basic concepts. We all know uh, what is pattern, but um, for example like pattern if in uh, software engineering or pattern in uh, computer architecture, but in this work uh, we would like to talk about such uh, logical patterns like for example core periphery or center periphery. We all know that the uh, city has a center and uh, some uh, surrounding <coughs> areas and if we look uh, deeper into this pattern we will see that um, it, it could be seen like uh, two meta patterns. It's uh, a center and a border meta pattern. <coughs> Uh, and um, later uh, um, uh, we should look uh, what is urban pattern. Uh, there are uh, very well known of uh, Christopher Alexander that uh, described more than uh, 200 of uh, urban patterns uh, such as country, countryside finger pattern uh, here you can see in the first picture how countryside and city meet uh, each, uh, each other and uh, uh, so the inhabitants can easily reach uh, uh, city facilities or go back from the city to the countryside if they live in countryside, like for example such pattern. And uh, below are two other patterns like um, city layout patterns, uh, city layout layout can, uh, can be sectoral or radial or linear and uh, these are also urban patterns. Uh, now uh, when we <laughs> know uh, what is a pattern we should uh, look in sp uh, what is spatial object. A uh, spatial object could be a simple one, it could be a composed object uh, made of uh, some parts it, it could be complex object that uh, uh, also is made of uh, of few parts and uh, some parts are even not connected to it. Uh, and uh, then with this basic uh, conception, uh, concepts, uh, we uh, should look into uh, ur urban pattern specification, also uh, look into mm -hmm. Mm, spatial data models and some 
methods uh, of spatial analysis. I will not go into details because it's <laughs> it's, it's too long. And um, uh, now the problem and uh, what was done. Uh, the main problem is that each uh, urban pattern, it doesn't matter if you take Alexander patterns or other um, system of the patterns, uh, it looks like we have uh, the same format. It, uh, it uh, contains some example, context of a pattern, problem, solution, uh, connection of other patterns, but uh, usually it's in the form of text. It, it's just a description or just a picture, like it could be <laughs> even a photo. And uh, uh, so the problem is that all patterns are very different in complexity in hierarchical level that uh, the pattern can appear in a uh, city layout, uh, in uh, some uh, closed area or even in the building, like huge buildings like hospitals and airports. And uh, all patterns have very different attributes and very different spatial features. So <coughs> uh, possible solution uh, to uh, to, des uh, to describe urban pattern was to take some urban patterns uh, to make some um, description system for them, look into their data model, then use them in some pattern analysis, and then go back to that urban pattern and look, uh, maybe there is a need to add some more attrib attributes and uh, similar things. Uh, in this slide we can see benefit and value uh, what those patterns are about. Uh, it's, um, if you're using uh, patterns in spatial analysis, it's uh, possible uh, to interpret and forecast uh, uh, many spatial objects features and uh, such answers like uh, where to build new uh, food restaurants or where to put entrance to uh, some shopping mall, uh, in, in which part of the building it's better <laughs> to do this, such, uh, such questions could be answered. So this is the first result, uh, very simple um, diagram of uh, uh, description of urban pattern. Uh, we see that um, mm, our pattern uh, is made of uh, several uh, meta patterns and meta pattern it's uh, it has uh, shape some physical uh, expression that uh, could be put uh, uh, and uh, draw uh, on the map and um, also we have uh, um, just simple pattern also uh, we have composed pattern and complex patterns and each pattern have uh, uh, has con configuration uh, it's um, the the idea of how many of how many meta patterns uh, it's made. Also, it, it has context because we we should know uh, should we use this pat or look for this pattern in the city or in the uh, district or in the building. Uh, and of course, it has uh, operation uh, that um, should look for um, that sh uh, should allow us to calculate that urban pattern and, uh, and <laughs> that's that's all I think about this um, now just a simple example how this uh, uh, how this look in in reality if we uh, if we took if we take some real patterns and some real data then uh, we have our pattern in the middle. We have two meta patterns like center and uh, border, as I said before. We could uh, see that uh, those two meta patterns, they uh, made up this uh, core periphery pattern. And also if we go more um, to, uh, to more complicated patterns, we will see that we have composed pattern uh, and uh, some generalizations like concentric city layout, sector uh, city layout, linear city la layout, and uh, uh, in the other in the other side, complex pattern, but uh, the example of such complex pattern could be multiple uh, nuclear pattern. It's a city that has uh, more than one center. 
and uh, we, uh, we just can see that uh, such such very very simple uh, pattern description could be suitable for for simple patterns. Um, now the next um, mm, the next idea was to look into uh, meta pattern because uh, meta pattern has it, uh, its own shape uh, data model uh, with uh, very very simple um, spatial primitives uh, data model. Uh, it uh, contains uh, geomet uh, geometric and uh, topological information, and uh, uh, and that uh, uh, now we can see the completed uh, 3D urban pattern, uh, the same. Uh, instant, um, the same items we saw before, pattern and meta pattern, and now uh, we could uh, find how um, the uh, meta patterns body, or um, in other words, its shape uh, also could be constructed from uh, spatial primitives like uh, body face, uh, arc, uh, node, and and so on. Uh, so, the last question, uh, what was left when we have such a simple description, uh, what, what we can do with it and what is our next step? So, the next step would be to use some of um, spatial <coughs> analysis methods. Um, one of them uh, that uh, looked more, uh, most uh, suitable for this task was uh, space syntax. Uh, space syntax, it uh, it uses vector map and makes a graph uh, out of it and uh, then it's uh, suitable to model functional and composite patterns uh, adapt uh, those patterns to different uh, to different hier hierarchical levels and uh, what is <laughs> the best about it that uh, space syntax use the same graph uh, uh, for, uh, for for very different patterns that means if you describe one pattern in in one way, you could add some uh, um, indicators uh, to it, and uh, at the same time, on the same map, you can use other uh, patterns with different indicators and uh, different data and and things like this. So, uh, conclusions of of this research was uh, just uh, <laughs> just to be sure that that basic urban pattern could be used. Uh, to describe very simple city models. Of course, this uh, uh, city model is, uh, this simple uh, pattern des description is not uh, good enough for real world uh, situations, so it, it should be um, improved. And uh, this is the um, task for the future work. And uh, uh, another thing that is, is planned to do in the future is to use uh, uh, space syntax method pos uh, possibilities uh, to detect uh, those real life patterns in real life data, like in the um, uh, cities in the whole world, not even Europe, and uh, to to improve that uh, pattern description in all attributes and. Um, other useful informa information that could be found there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, questions? Okay, please. Yeah, I'm not an expert at all in this domain, okay, but uh, I understand that uh, actually you created a simple ontology to describe a normal pattern. Is that it? At the end of uh, the sorry, day? methodology? Ontology. Uh, not exactly, but ontology could be used and uh, how to say connected to this thing, but okay. it not at, at this moment. Okay, and uh, what is uh, actually in which type of application we could use the results of this research? Uh, it's not clear to me, I don't know. Yes, very good question. Uh, you, you could use it, uh, for example, in S3 uh, Argus like in any yeah. geographic information system, of course you need to create a plugin and that is the <laughs> should be the result of, of this uh, research and just uh, you load a vector map in your um, geographic information system and do some, I don't know, 
commands like merge or simpli uh, simplify it, and, and then you can use uh, some space syntax uh, commands to calculate those patterns. Okay, very interesting problem to me. Thank you. I have one question, but we are short in time, so <laughs> I maybe will ask you in private after this section. Okay, okay. thank you. <coughs> and Okay, next presenter is one of the three So, hello everyone. As we have not much time, I will try to make it fast as possible. So, uh, I'm Elona Vitete and uh, my supervisor, Professor Sodrus Lopata, and I'm presenting uh, our paper, Problem Domain Knowledge Driven Generation of UML Models. So, uh, shortly outline, yes, uh, a little bit of introduction. I will present enterprise meta model, UML models, which, are, which we are doing, and the main part of course, generation part, and mm, example on business elements, business rule elements, variations, and conclusions and questions. So, uh, main problem is that uh, there are a lot of efforts, a lot of methods, methodologies uh, to generate UML models from different things like merging uh, different frameworks, different languages, different patterns, and even natural language. So it is quite a challenge for everyone. And uh, it is quite interesting mm, topic to research. And um, we are using enterprise meta model. It is presented and used by uh, the researchers from KT University, Vilnius University, and we are using it like a main object of our, mm, like a ground object of our research. So enterprise meta model is a model which consists of uh, collected knowledge, and this knowledge is already validated and verified. So it can used, it can be used in each s stage of information system development development life cycle phase, and. Uh, shortly about that I will talk soon. And the uh, main idea that we are trying to combine information which we had in half in uh, enterprise model and try to generate UML models. Uh, so the design phase would, it would be fully fulfilled. Uh, and shortly about enterprise model, it's not our result, it's a result of other researchers. We're just using it like a base for our research. So as you can see, it's, uh, it consists from different elements like actors, functions, pr uh, processes. Uh, processes are different, our material uh, uh, functions are different, our informational uh, flow, um, input, output attributes. Uh, of course, we have business rules, objective, and so on. So. This is a concept of knowledge which is uh, uh, saved in storage of uh, any case, uh, case tool, yes. So we think, we, we suppose that this information is already correct and, uh, and verified and validated by the experts so we can use it. And we are using in UML models generation uh, so I think you are familiar with UML modeling language and um, our research uh, is more uh, um, dedicated for behavioral models, for behavioral models uh, generation part. So shortly about that, I would like to say that, as you know, you, uh, UML is used in design, fa uh, design phase of information system lifecycle. And each of these models can show the same system, but in different perspective. For example, we have an element of actor, and actor in use case model is has one functions. In activity model, he uh, he ma may have different one. So it's just a different use for for the same system. So we are talking about dynamic models, then dy behavioral models, and we are working with this side. So main idea is that we are generating UML models uh, uh, from uh, enterprise model. 
so we already have all the information but we have to generate each element mm, so this is a top level uh, algorithm transformation algorithm for this purpose uh, so we are identifying uh, UML model which we want to generate then we select and identify the initial element then we generate it uh, after that we are searching for the element which is connected with that then we generate links and last part is the uh, business rules which is uh, connected to the particular model which we selected in the beginning for the generation part so main idea is that as I said we store have knowledge in enterprise model and this already validated and verified already correct so it should be quite easy to generate each UML model but there are some uh, some um, difficulties with that for example we have a fragment from enterprise model yes we have business rule which consists from interpretation rule realization rule information processing rule uh, so we use a uh, transformation algorithm to generate these elements and it is 11 and 12 step of transformation algorithm and in the result we have certain UML model element yes but uh, the main idea is that problem is in that uh, this element in different UML model can have different meaning because as I said different UML model has different perspective for the same system so for example in use case model uh, generation process from the business rule from the enterprise model we can get extend include or association the elements which is business rules in use case model but as they are generated from enterprise model we have to have uh, must have the information which is uh, saved in the enterprise model and can be related with use case model so we can have the result of use case model generation uh, so the inactivity model the same business rule means the control nodes and as you know in activity model control nodes are different it is initial flow final uh, decision match fork and so on join uh, nodes so it is very important to know which of them is a particular business rule in an enterprise model so there are other behavior models like UML state machine model UML state uh, protocol machine model and there are business rules also different elements so uh, here we can understand that in enterprise model in business rules element we have all the information which is related to every UML model element which relates with business rule and in sequence model we have the same part that business rule element can be generated into in this case into five different sequence model elements by different meaning of them so here we can say that uh, with the help of enterprise model we can choose which of the business rule elements can be generated in what UML sequence model element and uh, of course timing model the same story we have three different elements which can be generated from the same business rule element in enterprise model and in interaction overview model we have four elements which also can be generated from enterprise model so conclusions yes uh, we know that enterprise model was defined transformation algorithm I explained uh, business rule element variations I also presented and the impact of these variations is also described because we, as I said from the one enterprise model from one business element business rule element we can generate very different elements of UML diagrams the UML models so the main idea of the research is that in this case that only high quality information which is stored in the enterprise model can help us to generate correct and truly right elements of UML models.
Okay. So, thank you. Okay. Right. And one question. Or it can be later. <laughs> because no question. Okay, thank you. And the last last one presented is Prima Gustiani. Yeah, thank you very much. I am Prima Gustiani from Karlstad University, Sweden. And I also present my paper. I have a little short time, but I'll try to make as short as possible. And of course it will be difficult because my paper is about modeling. <laughs> um, so it always takes a lot of uh, time to present. Uh, but this paper is about visualization and contribution to open access. Two case studies were then, one at the Karlstad University, Sweden, another was a part of our project at the University of Makarora in uh, Uganda, and the uh, contribution to open access, but it is about, the paper is about how we visualize the process of publication, students' work publication, that is bachelor thesis, at uh, databases you know, in order to be transparent and reachable. So my, the agenda of my presentation will be, first of all, I'll uh, talk shortly, everything now will be shortly, uh, goals of the paper, research methods used. Uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the problems that we have with uh, conventional modeling methods and why we need new ones after 50 years uh, that we have modeling and use conceptual modeling. I'll talk a little bit about why modeling and integration, these two concepts are very important. Uh, I'll present a little bit cow vision for open research data and I'll talk about the DIVA is a portal or database that where we put our publications and our research. Uh, and I'll present uh, modeled versions of two case studies uh, because two, I was using two different modeling methods and made the comparison and uh, which method is better, which what is was the most important to see which method, modeling method, has more semantic power to uh, visualize the uh, necessary aspects uh, of the system. Or, and I'll finish my presentation with the conclusions. So the goals of the paper was, first of all, it was a contribution to our um, open access policy that we have at Calster University. Uh, and it was one of the uh, parts of our contribution, visualization um, of the process. Um, uh, I'll introduce different modeling methods that uh, this uh, visualization was made and to show, as I said, and to mo motivate which m modeling method mm, has more semantic power, which was uh, better to visualize this process, uh, business process. Uh, so research methods used, it was two case study done uh, and interviews were done both at the Kalsa University uh, libraries and uh, the department of uh, our information system department and as well interviews were done at the uh, Makarara University. In Uganda, uh, we, I also interviewed the um, representative of library and uh, institution, also Department of Information Systems. Two modeling methods are used. These two modeling methods we are using and teaching, and uh, both are, so to say, uh, to conciliate method is created uh, at the company in uh, Kalsta in uh, Sweden, and semantically integrated conceptual modeling method is uh, uh, constructed also and um, built in Sweden. Maybe the beginning was in Konas Technological Institute, but I also, uh, my research is a part of construction of this uh, method. Uh, but you can read about that in references. So actually now very shortly, who is involved in modeling, they know these problems. That we still have the problems with traditional modeling methods. Bec why? Because uh, existing traditional uh, modeling methods uh, do not integrate the two most important things 
in modeling, that is data and processes. They cannot go separately. That is the problem with UML. <laughs> you will be, uh, you didn't agree with me, but still, uh, we have to have a model or method that have um, provides us possibility to model and to show, to visualize uh, in that way that uh, the construct has possibility to integrate uh, sta uh, data, processes, interactions, uh, and structural and behavioral aspects. Behavioral, it means that data changes that uh, changes of data that take place when some action take place. Um, and of course, traditional uh, modeling methods provides us a lot of diagrams, 13, 16, but how to reach integration is the problem. And of course, uh, uh, the last problem is that we have no modeling construct or model that shows us the process, how we go, how we analyze from goals to implementation. Uh, so modeling in, in integration is very important uh, because uh, just modeling helps us to visualize, specify, construct, and document the structural and dynamic aspects of the system. Modeling is just uh, the only way to control and to manage complexity, to detect uh, uh, the characteristics that we would like to avoid is discontinuity, uh, discompleteness, um, and ambiguity. This is what we try and can do and overcome just with modeling. And of course, we modeling helps us to see if we are doing the right thing, and if we are doing the right thing right. Validation and verification. And integration, it's not enough just to analyze different aspects or different parts. Integration is very important. Synthesis, not just analysis. Uh, so what are we are doing, or I'll show in this example, is of course it is about conceptual modeling and uh, what we need, uh, the purpose of conceptual modeling is to provide, of course, a set of constructs, rules and principles. So uh, when we build uh, some construct or method or methodology, it should provide these things in order to increase understanding of problem domain, to help analysis and uh, design and of course facilitate better communication agreement and learning process everything what we do we do for people usually we pay a lot of attention to uh, IT implementation but usually we have wrong implementation because analysis and design was not uh, made correctly or modeling was not used at all we have to have a way to define the goal Okay, it could be at the very high level as a um, text or some textual, but you know our uh, natural language is very ambiguous. We have homonyms, synonyms, and actually uh, the semantic problems of communication is uh, one of the biggest problems between business people and IT people. It's a long, uh, so uh, the old problem. So now Calci University Vision is, uh, has, uh, yes, uh, an open research data to be one of the uh, open university and to be uh, preserving knowledge and to be transparent and to, so we have, the university have some policies that we have to follow uh, concerning promoting open access. In uh, last year, Swedish Research Council was appointed as a coordinator of the implementation of open access to research data. And it was especially in the uh, um, National Library of Sweden and National Archives, so, and of course, higher education institutions. It was important for them that all publications that we publish, that students publish, should be put somewhere where we can share and that it uh, should be transparent for others. 
and uh, of course Calste University took the part of this national network for open research data. DIVA is a portal or repository or database that we have in Sweden and um, it is now it is 47 different universities uses this DIVA uh, portal or database the, where we put our publications and students when they finish when they get the grade they also publish so now uh, what we do did the, this uh, modeling of this uh, publication process uh, so DIVA was uh, developed in Uppsala University in Sweden in 2000 and uh, of course now 47 different universities uses this DIVA repository so visualization of publication it's not enough to have the manual that we have of course we have manual with text but we think that uh, it's important to have a complementary visualization that it's always easier to understand uh, because a picture is worth a thousand words so two cases were done uh, and uh, first of all this uh, modeling case was done with to conciliate uh, method uh, that supports actually uh, analysis and developing of the organization and uh, what is very good that this method is applied and integrated in the tool so um, our students are using at the A level this tool to generally to define the process modeling on the very high level of abstraction. But I think from my po modeling point of view, I think that it's not enough and uh, I'll show and tell why. So I was um, remodeled this the same process with our semantically integrated conceptual modeling method that we called SICM and uh, I'll tell also why. So the scenario of our publication process when the students get the grades is as following. We have six actors involved. We have a uh, supervisor, we have uh, examiner, we have student, we have administrator, uh, and we have two databases, DIVA and LADOC. LADOC is a database where we put all the student results. So actually when supervisor gets the final thesis from the student, he sets the grade and sends the final thesis to the examiner. It could be two. Uh, when examiner evaluates the thesis, he sends the notification about the grade to the student and to the administrator to approve the thesis in registration in DIVA. But when the student gets the approved grade, he himself registers his thesis in DIVA. It is uh, almost obligatory to do that. So then the DIVA sends the mail to administrator, it's a person who uh, notifies about notifying the publication and administrator approves the publication. He goes into the DIVA and looks, was it the correct version published? And then, if the correct mark, and then he reports the grade into the LADOC. So actually it was se uh, six steps uh, and the procedure was as following. The sequence was as following. So now, here you see in the corner, you, hear, you see the legends. And here is the process modeled using to conciliate method. It is very linear uh, online and uh, actors are attached to all the objects. Uh, DIVA or LADOC as a database is also is, could be seen as an actor or um, role as they define. So actually business object, that it would be as a flow, uh, application, they call this notation, actor role, activity and document that is going on. So actually as you remember when I showed, uh, uh, when I showed uh, six steps, now if we count here, sorry, oh no, no. No. 
sorry, 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 and we have no time enough. So it is attached, for instance, there is no interaction between actors, that is very important. Because now you see that some processes are merged. This approved thesis is sent to the administrator. The action is not shown. So actually, we think that this uh, way of modeling is not enough to understand what happens when some actors interact. It's very important because it has mu uh, much to do with the responsibility. Uh, so I think and we thought that it's not enough. So we modeled the same uh, process of publishing, first of all, at the Calster University, according to the same scenario, using our uh, Sigma method. And I would like to say some words about, shortly, about this method. Before, uh, I was uh, calling it uh, service-oriented uh, uh, modeling method for the analysis and design. Why it is service? Uh, this service, word service, is nothing to do with service-oriented architecture, nothing to do with implementation, <coughs> because I see service as an interaction. It is a dynamic process. So actually, this way of thinking, it's a new way of modeling based on interaction in this uh, uh, SIGMA method. And we see every enterprise as a system composed of different subsystems that can interact and they can play the role of service requester or service provider. So actually, we can analyze system using this interaction loop. Now we call into it a service. So the philosophy background of this, uh, our method is related a little bit to Bunge's philosophy. And he says that every subsystem, when subsystems interact, they cause changes in objects. And these objects should be manifested by properties. And it's, very re it's really so, because every time action takes place, we have input and we have output. Action should do something to input, otherwise it is not purposeful. So actually input and output is never the same. So actually changes when the action takes place to follow them, it's very important. Um, so this way of thinking that is uh, analysis could be based or the construct could be constructed on the way of interaction as a service I see helps us to integrate uh, internal or external behavior in one construct and integrate necessary architectural aspects just using one modeling notation or just one uh, diagram instead of UML's 13 or 16. So here are the constructs what we are using. I am not talking. We have also three-level framework. And we have the process and we have the language. So actually, through the goals analysis, we go to conceptual level here. And here we are using this construct. This construct was also built. It's not revolutionary. It's evolutionary. We take into consideration that service is very similar or interaction is very similar to communication action. If you are familiar of communication action theory, there are two perspectives combines this uh, communication action combines two perspectives. Intersubjective between actors or between people or between uh, software or hardware and objective part. Objective part shows what happens to data when some action takes place. So actually this construct integrates data and processes and that is what we would like wanted to reach. So this uh, construct or was constructed and um, now I'll show it was just example for instance when you have uh, how we um, <laughs> show the difference between uh, data that for instance uh, applicant had the just attribute name and security number but when he was employed he got two other attributes so we can follow and see so but here are the legend notation for 
uh, Sigma method. So we have just at the conceptual level, we have actors, just boxes. Then we have action. We have different kinds of flows. It could be information flow. It could be material flow. It could be um, uh, emotional or whatever flow. But here we talk about uh, this is information flow. Interaction and objects, and that is state transition. You know what is state transition. So actually now you see how we modeled, how I modeled the same cow thesis publication process. You remember all these six steps, what we done. So actually when supervisor gets the here, oh it's very difficult now to see. But you can follow, you can follow interaction between actors, yes, intersubjective perspective, and at the same time you see changes in data. So it is not in linear, it is uh, shows how uh, interaction take place and what happens to data. For instance, of course, it is, as I said, it's not revolutionary. It is, for instance, UML. Uh, experts know that it is, for instance, inheritance. Yes, that this is the transition. So there are similarities, of course, because we cannot make something new, very new, because people who are in modeling have to know. So actually, all these six steps were fi uh, very clearly defined, and then we go to the last act, it's Ladok, where Endiva is here, and it is obligatory for our students to publish it themselves. Here it's, now it is, I did interviews, it is at the Makerere University in Uganda, and they told how they, uh, so to say, the process of uh, uh, not publishing, because they also have database <coughs> called <coughs> this space, but it's not obligatory. There is actually no very m big collaboration between library and the institutions. Library is very on the very high level of, uh, of hierarchy. So actually they have 11 steps. And these steps involve different actors, not just supervisors. It's another process of thesis defense. So actually they have little bit research officers, uh, they have <coughs> graduate training research who sends everything in hard copy and soft copy to the library. But students student themselves, they do not publish or something. They were very interested when I presented uh, Calster University, University Modeling. Um, so I was modeled the same scenario, their scenario, uh, using our uh, method. And, uh, but the difference is that students uh, send soft copy and final thesis, hard copy, to this uh, act, and then they send to the library. And do they publish or not? It's not really clear. Uh, enough, but they were very interested because it was the project of open access, and uh, very, yeah, it was just uh, that this project was stopped. But it is because of uh, political issues. And now I'll uh, just to conclude very shortly that the goal of the paper was to show how the visualization of business process can contribute to. Uh, open access policies and open access policies it depends upon the university which policies they have and of course how we can contribute and to make these policies more understandable comprehensible uh, for different people different actors and uh, different uh, two different modeling methods were used for this process and um, in order to show which we think from modeling point of view is better. And based on the results, we see that Sigma meta ha uh, method has more advantages in comparison with to conciliate method. Because uh, if we look at the problems that we have with traditional methods, Sigma construct provides us possibility to integrate data and processes to follow interaction between different actors and uh, to conciliate method 
uh, does not provide that. It is a linear, one way, is on the sequence, and uh, it's very difficult to follow the interaction between different actors. That is important for some uh, responsibilities to follow. So I think that it was enough. Okay. Quickly, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank you questions for presenter and pilot after uh, because we're, we're waiting 50 minutes <laughs> maybe at the coffee break uh, already 50 minutes in, in the, the tutorial waiting for us in Beijing, no questions yes. but you can ask me later but, uh, I'll okay. ask with pleasure I think it's important because um, <laughs> um, you, you talk about uh, a classical modeling um, um, there are so many different model approaches, yes. huh? like a uh, toga, huh? like yeah, Paris, yeah, I know, SCI I know, I know, but it's not enough. And yeah, but I'm not sure. For me, it's not clear what is the difference of your new approach to all these high developed. Uh, yeah, but integration, yeah. integration. Yeah, you so cannot many, follow yeah, integration. So modeling approaches now with a high maturity. And furthermore, for me, it's not clear how can you apply this model to enterprises. Because you have an example from university, and uh, in my understanding, it's uh, very different from, uh, from many applications in enterprises. Now, what, what do you mean enterprise? Enterprise, it could be organization, it could be any no, no, no. problem enterprise domain. Is a profit, profit oriented company, that's not a university. Yeah, but usually we model what we like to do with the information systems development, mm -hmm. uh, analysis, and design uh, to solve some problems. And then we can do uh, problems that appear at the mm -hmm. organization or enterprise. And these other, all these traditional methods, as you saw or you can read, yeah. they do not provide us. Mm -hmm. Archimate, mm -hmm. Dory, we have a lot mm -hmm. of different. UML, yet, we are teaching UML. But yet we, uh, may I interrupt, yet we have uh, very modern modeling languages for business processes, let's say in BPML. Yeah. No, BPML, BPML is just for processes, yeah, but yet not yet for we, data. Yeah, yeah, but yet we have uh, some researches uh, that have been done recently in this day that the most semantical richness could be reached, uh, for example, by integrating the with the DDR and okay, the DDR. okay. How? How? It would be very nice to see. It would be very no, nice I mean, to see. This is, yeah, this is another aspect of the yeah. process. Mm -hmm. but, uh, okay. When I see, uh, from my perspective, very complex uh, graph. It's not a complex, it's very, so to say, it's a basics. Page 17, for example, it's very, for me, it's hard to comprehend. Yeah, it is hard. It is a language you have to know. <laughs> yeah, because it's a language you have to know the language. Do you know your mail? Do you know? At the very least, there should be some levels of abstraction and so on. You know, I know this uh, attitude. I am in the research in many years. Just BPML, UML, and I am coming with a new... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because these problems that I uh, showed here with traditional modeling methods, which method? Which uh, modeling method helps to solve them? Please, actually say to me. Actually, we didn't see a method here as well, just a uh, notation. No, wait a bit, it's uh, just a short paper. You can read about the method. No, 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 we no, have no, language. Please, please stop the discussion <laughs> because I have a lot of questions as, as well. And I, I modeling is, yeah, we can talk uh, all the day. We discussion during the dinner or, 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 I don't know, after tutorial, yeah? I expected this because I know, I know, I fight with YAML and BML. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay. So, thank you for the presentation. And all my time, so, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.